welcome back to the Earth on Survival Guide, the podcast for all disciplines, paths, players, and game masters, and the questers that are Josh and Dan. I am Dan. I am Josh. And on today's podcast, we will be talking about all things conspiratorial and the discussion about the secret society in Bar Save known as Naaman's Hand. Yes. Before we get to that, if you have any questions for us, because we just did a whole big old thing over at FredoniaCon, uh, we could use some new questions. We ran out of all the questions we had to talk about. So if you have any more for us, please contact us at edsgpodcast at gmail.com. Until then, until we get some questions, uh, let's talk about Naaman's Hand. Yeah, Naaman's Hand. This is apt to be a, a shortish episode. Yeah, there, there wasn't a lot to mine from the essay. <laughs> so Naaman's Hand is a, is a living legend cult, which is a sort of mm-hmm. collective term for a group of people that are dedicated to a particular legend or story or something along those lines. And they're trying to keep it alive. And trying to keep it alive or, you know, whatever their goals are. I mean, in the in a sense, the Seekers mm-hmm. of the Heart are kind of a living legend cult. Like, they are an organization that is dedicated to a, to a particular goal. Naaman's Hand actually first appeared under a slightly different name all the way back in the first edition Bar Save box set, where there is a Ooh. half-page description of the cult of Naaman Uras, which is the mm. individual that Naaman's Hand is dedicated to does it ever explain what naaman i mean he's considered a hero in thera is it ever explained what he did that was heroic or why he's so revered in thera because i don't i couldn't come across that in the scant research that i did yeah broadly the info in the bar safe box talking about the cult of naaman uras uh just says that he was a hero who fought the horrors in the years before the scourge okay that would make him a hero that's enough <laughs> Many believed that it would was possible for him to lead a massive army against the horrors and to prevent the scourge from taking place. That obviously did not happen. <laughs> but the legends sort of have contradictory descriptions of his fate. Yeah. One says that he fought a horror over the course of three days and it eventually killed him. Another says that uh, one of his followers was possessed by a horror and killed him. There are some people that suggest, in fact, that he never died at all and is still alive to this Hmm. day, even though, you know, it it has been, you know, 500 years or more since he would have been alive. Yeah. But basically, there are, uh, again, from the information in... The bar safe box, there are sort of three different categories of people when you talk about the various cults of Naaman Uras. There are those who think that he is somehow still alive, but has forgotten his identity and destiny. There are those who think that he died, but could be raised from the dead. And mm-hmm. there are those who think that it is possible to just find his spirit and to invest it into another body. And these various cults engage in endless debate, drawing upon various tales and legends that support their particular point of view and devote a lot of time to researching the legend and occasionally uncovering information and uh, pursuing him. Like there is one cult that is convinced that um, Naaman Uras was an elf, thereby making it actually possible for him to still be alive because of Mm -hmm. the extended lifespan of elves. Going off the first edition material here, several cults yeah, yeah, yeah. claim to have found his tomb, dug up the bones that they believed belonged to him, and went on uh, an epic quest of their own to raise those bones from the dead. Um, and some have actually succeeded, but none of the those that they have actually resurrected turned out to be Naaman, although all of them were very grateful yeah. for having been <laughs> resurrected. Brought but that's the, that's the general gist. Now, Naaman's yeah. hand which appears in the Secret Societies of Barsay book, is the second category of those three that I mentioned, the kind that thinks that he, in fact, died, but could be raised Mm -hmm. from the dead. And it's the second uh, uh, publication that actually talks about Naaman's hand, because I think there's like four total, maybe even five publications. There's uh, the Barsay box at the Secret Societies book, the Dragon Source book mentions Naaman's hand, and then uh, the new fourth edition, Trevar Source book. So... This is something that's prevalent. Yeah, we had mentioned Naaman Uras briefly when we were talking about the great dragons. The great dragon, mm-hmm. Aban, who lairs in the mist swamps. One of the rumors that the outcast mentions um, is the possibility that actually Naaman's bones are 
one of the treasures that she has hidden away in the mist swamps and is the one that kind of talks about also talks about Naaman being Theron and why that might be that the dragons are kind of keeping his body secreted away. Although Mm -hmm. I think it is in the Naaman's hand essay in secret societies that it first talks about him being a, a Theron hero. Yes. Because it does mention he's a Theron hero. Yes. So why don't you, since you read the essay in Secret Societies more thoroughly than I did, okay. why don't you bring us into that? I'll do a quick, quick little rundown because it was a it was a wonderful essay, but it mostly recapped everything else. And so these all, um, all four of these publications in the real the real world actually kind of overlap consistently. Um, so they borrow heavily from one another. So as Josh pointed out, Naaman's hand, uh, basically there's like four distinct groups dedicated to finding Naaman Uras. Naaman's hand is one of them or finding his final resting place. Cause they're still convinced he's this, this one, Naaman's hand is convinced that he's dead, uh, that he was a Theron hero. This is led by a 10th circle wizard slash 10th circle nethermancer elf named Emirisol Ven Marin, uh, who, once upon a time did come across this hugely powerful ritual spell. It's actually listed in the secret societies of bar save book, which I don't think this spell has ever been republished anywhere else. No. And this is called recall the ancient spirit, 10 circle, 10 nethermancer or wizard spell. So I don't know if Morgan's working on this one or not, but I'm, I'm imagining not to bring it into fourth edition because <laughs> it's pretty powerful. So Emir Sal Van Maren, uh, resurrected someone that could be Naaman Ross or maybe Naaman Ross's brother, Alainan, because he's going by the name Alainan. And he actually is resurrected. It almost killed Amirasol. It took him several months to do this. So it's some pretty powerful ritual magic to bring somebody back from the dead. Many, many threads, lots of power. You know, he needed to be there constantly for days on end. And yeah, so now he's palling around with this guy named Alainan Ross. Yes. Don't know if it's his brother, and it's kind of supposed somewhere in the essay that perhaps it's actually Naaman himself, but they're not entirely sure. Uh, So other members of this group, Naaman's Hand, who report to Emirisol, or at least are in league with him, uh, are fifth to eighth circle of any discipline, every discipline, you name it, they're just there, because they're all care delving, they're scouring the mist swamps, they're looking up legends and so forth. They spend most of their time in libraries across all of Barsave, but they do have a private primary library in Trevar, hence the Trevar source book. Um, and it's called the Western Tower, sorry, it's in the Western Tower of Old Town, but the library is named Delver's Athenium, and it is their base of operations. Yeah. That is the majority of the game stats you can get. There's a secret little part of the legend that if the players are listening, turn it off now, come back in about 90 seconds. If the game masters are listening, Elaine and Ross and Naaman Ross are brothers, but all the legends that they did were under the same name. So they have a specific- Or got conflated to all be credited to the same person. Yeah. So they are technically, they have a group pattern unto themselves of two. Right. And so- Elenin being resurrected feels half of his pattern is missing because Naaman has not been found. And so he could be Naaman Ross because his legendary exploits were done under the same name, but he is Elenin. So it's, it's a very wonderful story to have. Yeah. There's some like weird magical theory stuff that's kind of going on along with this that lends some credence to the idea that Legends and stories have a more outsized effect on true patterns and whatnot than I tend to feel. I mean, I like weird magical stuff. This is cool, though. (laughs) On the one hand, I like the idea of this legend of this hero that everybody thought was, Mm -hmm. you know, this this legendary hero was actually a pair of brothers And because of time and the way that memory and legend and story work. And names. You know, the truth is not what people remember. And Mm -hmm. it's certainly possible when dealing with some weird magical stuff, especially if you're dealing with this powerful ritual magic spell that 
takes a long time to cast and whatnot, um, that perhaps uh, the brothers had a group true pattern of sorts and that the interactions of things caused some kind of weird side effect when they brought him back or whatever. Mm -hmm. I could spin all kinds of weird magical theory related stuff. Oh, yeah. uh, Just fine. Uh, Unless there are references in between the bar safe box set and secret societies that I did not find in my quick search of things. Mm -hmm. This is sort of the point. It's like naming your Ross was a seed that was kind of dropped in the soil very early on. And we're getting to this point of, oh, hey, let's explore this and do this weird kind of thing. And, oh, here's a cool little twist. Let's instead of just having a legendary hero, let's make them brothers. And they're from Vasgothia and Theron and did stuff. And there's some weird magical thing going on with the guy who brought him back, who is claims to be a descendant of them and wanting to keep her secret and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But ultimately... There's not a lot here. Agreed. It's it's ultimately this is not something that is given enough meat on the bones of this here. Even when you go and you factor in the additional information from what would have been a sort of a, a source book published not long after that, this with the dragons. Yes. And this book also connects Name and Yoros to the Mist Swamps and Aban and plays up the Theron connection and maybe the Theron interest in the mist swamps and things that are going on there. This feels like one of those things that is potentially being set up as a hook or thread or something that would have been involved in a more fleshed out version of Bar Save at War, possibly. I agree. That this potentially could have been a a secondary chapter of events that Mm -hmm player characters would be involved with, but that would not necessarily have any kind of noticeable effect on on the the broader outcome of the war and the events there in much the same way that the Ardelia story in Prelude to War is one that is in some sense very potentially personal for the player characters, particularly if they had interacted with Hanto and, and that story kind of going along, but that the Ardelia story is not one that is a huge deal in terms of broader political things in bar save except in the sense that the dragons are interested in her the therans have her and the dragons would kind of want to get her back but that's very different from the ground level socio-political maneuverings between thrall and thera and it's possible that the whole naaman's hand cult thing and the elf being brought back to life and the interest in Aban and the mist swamps could have been something that could have been a branch or a spin-off or related in some way to something that would have been going on in the war but i don't feel like there was necessarily a lot there to work with. Well, enough groundwork laid <clears throat> for me to see mm, how that yeah. could have fit in. Let me put it that way. Fair. No, yeah. I'm, no, there I'm is groundwork it. that is being laid here, and it could have just been, hey, here's a kind of cool, weird, magical side thing going on with this legendary hero. Maybe it's something that wouldn't have been involved in the war, but would have been developed more in a post-war situation. Yeah. I mean, there's there is certainly some stuff that you could do with this, but it is a focused story. It is potentially a campaign goal and nothing hugely jumps out at me in terms of, you know, unless you are making Naaman Uros a focus of your campaign in some capacity or that mm-hmm. the goals of the player characters are coming into conflict with the goals of Naaman's hand in some respect. Yeah. This is a very sort of personal thing. Similar to the Fellowship of Night, who we talked about in our previous one. Yes. Yeah. This is something that if you find some inspiration and can think of some use for them because of where the group happens to be and what they're getting involved with, great. Mm Mm-hmm pick that up and and run with it and maybe have it be a a thread that's kind of weaving in and out of your campaign longer, but you can absolutely ignore them as a presence. If your game is not running parallel to or adjacent to what's going on with this at all. And that's fine. Again, it's not like the eye of Thrall who we haven't talked about yet, but we will. It's not like (laughs) the life rock rebellion 
which is a lot more involved in broader events of things. This is a a smaller, yeah. more personal sort of thing. And that's fine. Like not everything needs to yeah. be epic and and earth shattering in order to be good. Yeah. And you can certainly drop in Naaman's hand, have your party run across Naaman's hand. You see, and maybe drop the bait a little bit and see if anybody wants to bite on, you know, following them around or stopping them or encouraging them to take your pick. Uh, but it, it is possible, you know, just have them cross paths with them and see if any of your players' characters and their motivations align, oppose, uh, kind of run parallel to whatever, uh, if they want to, you know, if they're both all going to the mist swamps at the same time, because there's places that you can find Naaman's hand across bar save because they're researching legends. They're always in libraries. So it's possible they could hear about this, but you know, if they're Theron sympathizers, sure. They might want to restore Naaman's hand. Naaman, if, if not, you know, stop. Sure. Him. And another, another possibility because Naaman's hand is not the only Naaman Uros cult that's yeah. out there. There's three more. There are others that have different yes. ideas about what's going on. Like one of the adventure ideas that's in here, yes. because each of the societies are, are presented with a couple of ideas. Oh, yeah. I always love the adventure. Hosts. The characters find a helmet that has a strong magical aura and indications that it might be connected to Naaman Uros, drawing the attention of Naaman's hand. It could mm -hmm. also draw the attention of another cult. And like that yeah. conflict could potentially be kind of navigating that sort of thing could be interesting. Are you going to ally with them? Are you going to like, what kind of potential situations could you have? There are some interesting things that you could do, even potentially as a, as a sub arc or side sort of thing that you're dealing with a possibility that. If you had a group where maybe one of the characters had died, you're dealing with a group that has the ability to possibly bring back people from the dead. Resurrection magic is not a common thing in Earth Dawn. No. And maybe you would be interested in Naaman's hand because of their reported ability to be able to bring people back from the dead, even ones that had been dead for some time. Uh, centuries, we're talking. <laughs> and so therefore to possibly bring back a companion or some other sort of thing. And maybe your interest in Naaman's hand is getting access to that magic. And maybe you need to perform some services for them mm -hmm. in order to maybe get the information that you're looking for yeah. from them to achieve your own goals. Yeah. Some reciprocity or flat out coin. Cause you know, they got to eat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they're, they're wandering around. They got to eat. There are some, story ideas that you could have, even if you don't necessarily want them to be a major campaign focus, they could be an interesting, like sort of recurring NPC group, possibly antagonists, possibly allies, maybe sometimes one, maybe sometimes the other who show up in and out of your main sort of campaign story arc, if you want to make things interesting or have a, a sidetrack or something like that. So there's some really yeah. interesting ideas and a little bit of world building that's going on there. Mm -hmm. Things would be perhaps a little bit different with them in the post-Second Theron War situation. Maybe not right. dramatically, because if they're still obviously, you know, they're going to be around, they would still be looking for Naaman Uros mm -hmm. and pursuing those goals. Maybe they actually did succeed. What does that mean in terms of the future of... Thera or whatever. Yeah. I, I don't have any real speculations on that, but there could be some interesting ideas. When you bring back a legendary hero from centuries mm -hmm. past, the idea yeah. of a man out of time, or in this case, an elf out of time. Time. Supposedly an elf. We're not entirely being sure. Being in a very different situation, someone who was Theron, but maybe coming into a present day and seeing what Thera has become. Mm -hmm. The present day Thera, com you know, compared to 500 years ago, the Thera. one that they had five or 600 years ago, mm -hmm. the idea that maybe they were idealistic to a certain extent or not exposed to even the abuses of Thera back in that day could be a yeah. very interesting ally uh, on the side of someone going up against Thera. Not that Thera is a problem for Barsave, but heck with Naaman Uras's connections to Vasgothia, Maybe the new Vasgothia book, they like they could go back and, and maybe have some connection with what's going on there and have some yeah. 
knowledge about pre-scourge Vasgothia that would be of great interest to um, mm-hmm. the the folks in, in that area, the renamed people that go into the circle of renaming or whatever it's called. I can't now remember off the top of my head. No, fair. That could be an interesting approach that you take with that in terms of utilizing some of the the fourth edition material. That could certainly make things interesting or complicated for a Mm Vasgothia-based campaign. Absolutely. I was actually going to ask, since there is a Vasgothia book in the pipeline, are there any plans to include a blurb, a paragraph, an update about Norman Ross himself? Okay. The book is written and there is nothing about, to my knowledge, from what I have read in terms of having done the layout, there was not any kind of mention that I came across of Naaman Uras that I remember. That's okay. Fair. That Vasgothia speculation was like, oh, wait, he's from Vasgothia. That could make things interesting for that. But there's nothing in that book that is related to that. Wanted to make that clear. Yeah. Nick was basically doing a lot of his work based on the Theron Empire. Oh, yeah. Vasgothia chapter rather than tidbits from other books. Looking to the Barsafe material. Yeah. Fair. Nope. I'm actually good with that. This very easily would have been something that, that would have been overlooked. So. No problems. Uh, yeah, it's it's uh, been mentioned already in four publications uh, through first and fourth edition. So I think Naaman's, Naaman's hand has been covered to the extent that it needs to be covered because it's very vague. Not a lot of ground has been covered. And so it's pl- it's ripe for the perfect game master to expand upon that to your desire to do so. And we don't have any particular plans. It doesn't necessarily mean that as future stuff is worked on for Earth Dawn, if like we need something and it seems like a an appropriate task to bring them in or update, then we certainly could. But the bit that's in the Trevar book, yeah, is sort of the the current update of where things stand with them and go from there. Yeah. So if you're looking for that, it's the Trevar source book pages 131 to 134. Knock yourself out. Uh, any final thoughts on Naaman's hand? Because we knew this was going to be quick because, like I said, vague enough to be useful, not distinct enough to be, you know, jump into the. Yeah, here's. Your I think there's some there's some cool stuff there. This is actually one of those things that would be interesting to pose a question to Lou Aside from the references here in this book and in Dragons, was there anything that you that he could recall? Yeah. In terms of, oh yeah, we like because I there there was not anything in any of the late notes or or outlines, but was there some kind of idea that he had in his head, or was this just simply a case of yeah, somebody came with some good information about that and we wrote it up and what, like with be? a lot of their stuff <laughs> was throwing things out there and. You know, when a writer found something interesting to do and pick up later on, then they would go with it. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, so, folks, if you have any questions for us about Naaman's Hand or you have some ideas on how you may have used them or would like to use them, uh, drop us a line. We'd love to hear stuff like that and we'll read it on the air more than likely. Yeah, contact us at edsgpodcast at gmail.com. And until next time, go resurrect your own legend. Good night, everybody. <laughs>